Our text from the Old Testament reading, Malachi chapter 3, in Jesus' name, Amen. What's the bottom line? What do I get out of it? That's the common attitude of most people living in this world. It was really no different 2,500 years ago in the day and the lifetime of Malachi. The people of Judah had turned so far away from God that God allowed the power of Babylon to defeat their nation, destroy the temple, take all the people away into exile by 586 B.C. God's gracious promise brought some of the people and their descendants back to Jerusalem about well, 70 years after the beginning of the exiles, but about uh, maybe 40 years after the ultimate exile. They had rebuilt the city and the temple, these returning people. But by the time of Malachi, about 430 BC, they were again falling into the very same sins of rebellion and idol worship that led to their previous defeat and exile. Religious leaders and people alike were drawn into the idea that it wasn't worth it to worship God. In verse 13, God accuses them. You've said harsh things against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? Well, in our text, verse 14, we hear what they said. It is futile to serve God. Futile. The same word is translated in the second commandment as vain. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, in a futile way, in an empty, meaningless way. It's almost as if they're thumbing their noses at God's commandment when they ask that question. They see no value, no reason to worship God. It goes on in verse 15, God continues with what they had said. We call the arrogant blessed, evildoers prosper, those who challenge God escape. Challenge here is the same Hebrew word that Malachi used a little earlier in verse 10. Translated there usually as test. There, in verse 10, God invites them to test Him by trust and obedience. To bring their complete tithes into the temple and see Him pouring out blessings upon them. But they turn His word around. They say that people who test God, or challenge God, they mean, escape. In other words, they're not testing God with obedience and seeing how it'll end up. They're testing God with disobedience and unbelief. Testing and trying to see how much they can get away with. It brings to mind the beginning of my year as an RA in college resident assistants on our dormitory floor and we had a meeting with the guys on the floor and uh, you know tried to emphasize the the kind of of uh, regulations and and rules that we were supposed to abide by the things we weren't supposed to do and all that and and that if we followed these things we would have a better year together but you could probably imagine how that turned out in the long run there were those who were going to break the rules no matter who said what. Uh, and that's kind of the attitude here. We're going to test you by seeing how much we can get away with. To them it seemed there were no limits of evil and no punishments to fear of the people of Malachi that he was speaking to. We live in much the same kind of attitude today, don't we? For most people the goal of life is to get the most. Most money, most possessions, most pleasure possible. What's the bottom line is the question. What do I get out of it? How do I profit? And that becomes the way we judge our actions. What's best for me? You know, the rich and the famous sometimes become that way through cheating, trickery, power misused, other evil ways. Sexual sin is a topic of humor. Public officials are honored even if their personal lives are terribly wrong. 
And even the church gets hooked by the way the world thinks. Religious teachings that stray away from the Bible, becoming nice words that hopefully don't offend anybody. Things like, all gods are the same, all religions lead to heaven, it's rude to claim that there's only one absolute truth in the world. The idea that we need to act like the world, offering more entertainment to get the people's attention and to be accepted by the world. But the word of God through Malachi accuses us today the same as it did long ago. The desires of the world are not the desires of God for his people. The ways of the wicked will, well, they may prosper for a while, but they will not prosper in the end. There will come a day of judgment and a time of punishment that will never end for those who don't fear the Lord. I wonder if you caught, you know, uh, the Psalms and poetry in the Old Testament very often echo ideas. Did you catch that in our intro today? It talked about the fear of the Lord. Let me, let me just look at the words so I get them right. The fear of the Lord and standing in awe of Him. It's not being terrified of God that fear refers to. It's, it's standing in awe of God. It's In other places, the word fear is paralleled by the word trust. You know, it's that loving trust of God, that awe in His presence that we're talking about here. The Word of God is powerful. When Malachi spoke it, some of the people who heard it did respond, feared the Lord. That is, they believed and trusted Him. Then God's Word led them to true repentance. They were truly sorry for their sin, and they trusted truly in God for forgiveness. It said they talked with each other. Perhaps in repenting for wrongs they had done to each other, certainly in confessing the same faith in the true God and encouraging each other in doing so in the midst of a world where that's not normal. It reminds me that an important reason we come to church together is to encourage and help one another, build up one another in our faith and our life. Well, what was the result? God listened and heard their cries of sorrow repentance and faith. God had their names written in a scroll of remembrance, it said, a sign that He would forever remember those who trusted Him and honored His name. He promised, they will be mine in the day when I make up my treasured possession. That's an amazing promise. God considers them part of His most beloved belonging like a treasured family heirloom. He says, I will spare them just as in compassion a man spares his son who loves him. For us, living in the New Testament age, living in the last times, properly understood, this leads us to think of Christ Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, St. Paul writes, God did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all. God loved us so much that He gave up His one and only Son so that He would save us. There should be no doubt that we are God's treasured possession. The world is always looking for the bottom line, for some benefit here and now. But God works in ways that the world just doesn't understand. One man dying on a cross seems like a sad end to a sad story. But God uses it to work salvation for all of mankind. Words in a book the Bible may seem like any other book, and many people regard it that way, but God uses these words to bring His light and His life into the sin-darkened world. A little bit of water seems unimportant. 
but God uses it with His Almighty Word to create new spiritual life, to make new members of His family, to make brothers and sisters in Christ, to make children of God. A little bit, a very tiny bit, of bread and wine seem insignificant and physically unsatisfying, but God uses them, again, joined to His Almighty Word to bring the true body and blood of Jesus to us, to forgive our sins, to heal our souls, to remind us of God's promise for that day coming. Here's the promise. You are my treasured possession. And this proves it. And we pray, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.